today, let's just see ourselves in a living room together. It's actually the truth that the early church gathered in homes daily. They were in people's homes, and then they were in the temple courts, but they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which we have right here, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. That's what we're here for. We need a bigger space because we meet in bigger groups most of the time. Right now, we're socially distant, and that's good and all, but this is kind of our living room today, and we're just going to do a Bible study today, all right? Most of you in, in your living rooms, you don't have the benefit of Andrew Lutz rocking out on the drums, for example. So we get a little few extra perks because of the bigger space, but we're just going to do a Bible study today. And we're going to look at John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. So would you read with me? It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drawing them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And we're going to see in a little bit how Peter did come to understand what was going on. So let's skip ahead to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. How do you guys feel about the fact that we just skipped four verses there? You kind of wonder what those four verses said. We went from verse 7 straight to verse 12. What did we miss? Let's look at it. Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I almost got that mixed up. Head and shoulders, knees and toes. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who he was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So you understand why we skip these verses. What does that have to do with service, right? So let's go back to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Anybody still nagged by those four verses that we just kind of glossed over? Now, for a lot of you, when I said, well, that's not about service, so you understand why we skipped over it, you're like, yeah, I've heard this a million times. I was tempted not to come to church today because I have heard several dozen sermons on Jesus washing his disciples' feet, right? We've grown up. We understand what this is about. Why do we have to listen to this again? I'm going to take a quick time out here because I really need to. For those of you who are involved in the CBS ministry, um, in leadership, uh, John asked me to preach like two months ago, and this was the first thing that really was laid on my heart to preach about, and then there were a few other things that I thought about preaching about, but then if you're working with CBS, you know we were asked to review this passage, and it was kind of a confirmation. The rest of you, I'm sorry. Like, you're like, what is he even talking about? But I really did need to give that disclaimer there. You're going to have to trust me on that. So most of us, we, we've heard this story over and over and over again. We know that it's about serving one another. And if Jesus served us, of course we need to serve others, right? Some of you, though, maybe you haven't heard this story before. Maybe you're at home. And So when I just said, yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, that was a little confusing to you. And it should be. 
Because when we look at this, and Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me, that does have something to do with what he's doing. He's washing their feet, and he's talking about washing. So the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, this is part of it. This is part of what we're supposed to understand. And then Peter says, well, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus says, hey, you're already clean. You've already had a bath because of the words I've spoken to you. He didn't say it there, but we're going to see it in a second. So there's more going on here than maybe what we have typically realized. Is anybody getting excited that we might get to explore the scriptures and in a way that maybe we haven't done before? That makes me excited when I realize like Jesus has stuff to say that maybe I haven't really processed before. So let's take a look at this. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. That's what Jesus says. Just a few hours later at the most, it's two chapters later in the book of John, they're walking towards the garden, or they're walking through the garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. That would be Judas Iscariot, for example. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes or washes, is literally what it says, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So what is going on with this washing bit here? This is something that Jesus has to say to his disciples. Well, remember, Jesus told Peter, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter wrote a couple books of the Bible. Maybe he even shows us that he did understand what was going on here. And so we can see in 1 Peter, let me give you the context by the time we get halfway through chapter 3. Peter's writing a letter. He didn't write nearly as many letters as Paul did, at least that we have. And so he covered several different topics in his letter, his first letter, 1 Peter. And one of the things he talks about is just acknowledging the reality that the Christians that he's writing to were dealing with persecution. They're struggling. So that's where we pick up right here when he says, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For if Christ also suffered once for sins, keep that in mind, the righteous for the unrighteous, he's righteous, we're not. He dies for us and for our sins. He did that to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but it made alive in the spirit. He continues, after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. I'm not going to lie, this is a confusing passage, and it's a whole other thing to look at sometime, but whoa, whoa. He's talking to people who were disobedient long ago after being made alive. What's he talking about? But let's keep going. This seems like a tangent, but it's going to pay off here in a second. It in it, only a few people, in the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So Peter says, Jesus died for our sins, and now we are baptized into his death. And it doesn't wash dirt off of us. Our baptism, and he's talking about a spiritual baptism we'll see in a little bit, it's washing away our sins, right? We, we understand this washing away. What is going away? It's our sins. That's what we're being washed of. So, if we're starting to understand that Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me, he's saying, we're washing away your sins. You're identified in my death and resurrection. God is forgiving your sins. If we understand that that's what a bath is, then here's the question. What is foot washing? Okay, the bath 
is the forgiveness of our sins, washed clean so that we, we are clean, but, but then our feet get dirty. So what we're going to do is we're going to just say, hey, we're in a Bible study right now, and I'm going to give us a couple minutes. I might even sit down. We're going to take just a couple minutes, and I want you to just digest this scripture here. If you're at home, maybe you've got it in your Bible in front of you. Maybe Scott's put it up on, on the TV for you or on your screen. Process this. If being washed is Jesus dying for us and washing away our sins, what does foot washing represent? If you're getting antsy, we'll do another 30 seconds or so, all right? This is kind of hard, isn't it? Wrestling with these scriptures that we've kind of just skipped over some of us in the past. I know I would read this passage and I already knew what it was about and I'd just be like, oh, that's weird. And that was it. So what is Jesus talking about here when he's washing people's feet and you know, being washed is being forgiven of our sins? Well... Let's try to put this together. Jesus knew, this is the context. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he wrapped a towel around his waist. The context, the reasoning behind this has something to do with the authority and the mission that he had been given. In light of the fact that he was sent from God and in fact was God and was returning to his glory, he wrapped a towel around his waist. Well, a few chapters later, a few days later, this is on the evening of the first day of the week, which would be Easter. He has risen from the dead early in the morning. Now it's the evening, a few hours later. When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, said, peace be with you. Settle down. It's okay. You're okay. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Now watch this. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So all authority had been given to him. He was in charge. He knew that he was going to be ascending back into heaven and so he said, the authority that was given to me and the mission that was given to me, now I'm sending you. Here's how you can do this. Receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. And for the first time, God himself, creator of the universe, was living inside of people. They have received authority and they've received power to do his mission. Do you know the very next thing he says? If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. If we, having taken a bath, having been washed, see that our sins have been taken away. 2 Corinthians 5 said that God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. If our sins are being washed away 
and we are clean, if that's what's going on, then maybe the idea that we get our feet dirty is the idea that even, especially back in the day, after you've taken a bath, you still aren't just going to hang around your house all day. You're going to go outside and you're going to be wearing sandals and you're going to wander the streets of Jerusalem, for example. Their feet were dirty as they went up to the upper room. They were following the same streets that donkeys were walking on, maybe some camels or something. And every once in a while, you know, we've got the parades with the pooper scoopers, right? Animals would make a mess. And this is the street that everybody's walking on. Even if they've taken a bath and most of them's clean, their feet still get dirty. Even though we have been forgiven our sins, even born of the Spirit, many of us, can you relate to the idea that maybe still as we walk around our day-to-day life, we're still messing up? We're still sinning? We're still getting our feet dirty? Our day-to-day lives, we're messing up? And Jesus says, I forgive you. And if I, your teacher and your master, are going to forgive you, you need to forgive one another. And so when he gives us the authority and the mission that he had been given, and he says, now I'm sending you, the first thing he says is, go forgive people. Now he said, if you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. But elsewhere, Jesus has already told him, unforgiveness is not an option. He's just saying, like, this is big business here. You are in the business of forgiving people, and you need to do it or it's not done. So he charges us, through his example of washing our feet, within the church especially, sometimes we do things to each other that are hurtful. And Jesus says, forgive each other. That's actually a really difficult teaching when you think about it. I don't know how many of you have ever been a part of a church anywhere, whether it's Gateway or somewhere else. Maybe you're here because of something that happened at another church. Church people hurt each other sometimes. And what Jesus is saying is, I have given you the authority and the command and the power to forgive one another. All right? So that seems pretty straightforward. Did Peter get this later? You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. How about this? First Peter 4, 7 through 8. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Even Peter got it, as Jesus said he would. So what's the moral of the story today? Well, first of all, we need to forgive one another our day-to-day sins by the power and the authority of God's Holy Spirit. Love covers over a multitude of sins. But, I mean, that's, that's not completely why we did this today. Hopefully this was an object lesson. Hopefully some of you are really excited about the opportunity to read the Bible, not read into the Bible. It's not our fault when we're, some of us are raised in a church culture where for generation after generation we've, we've been taught some things about what the Bible says. And so when we approach Jesus washing the disciples' feet, almost all of us were taught from the day we were five years old, that we need to serve one another. Now, do we need to serve one another? Yeah, we do. We do. Philippians 2 makes that very, very clear, where Paul points to Jesus having humbled himself from heaven down to earth and then giving his life. And Paul says, that needs to be your attitude. You need to lower yourself. And we will never lower ourselves as low as Jesus did. He started in heaven. He started as God, all right? So we are commanded to serve. There's no question about that. This this reinterpretation of Jesus washing his disciples' feet does not let us off the hook from serving one another. We just have a different place in the Bible that tells us that. Now we have this additional thing where we need to forgive one another. But the bigger picture is that sometimes we feel that we've already got this figured out here. If we were raised in Sunday school or we've been a Christian for a decade or two, we start to feel like we've heard enough sermons, we've watched enough sermons even on YouTube, we're starting to get this 
and we understand everything that's in here. This is an enormous book. There's a lot of words in here, all right? It's very likely that you and I don't actually understand everything that's in here. So I don't know if you remember uh, a couple months ago, probably the last time I preached, we were looking at Jesus saying, um, if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's not good for anything. And we talked about how salt is a preservative. So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. He's saying you're meant to preserve the earth, the world, the people around you, the culture, the society. And so the question is, if we are the salt, if we are the preservative, is the world around us being preserved? So let's ask the question as American evangelicals, is our culture, is our society, is the world around us being preserved or is it being the opposite of preserved? I know what I think. <laughs> so if it's possible that the salt has lost its saltiness, maybe we need some help. Jesus says it can't be made salty again. He's just pointing out that this is an impossibility. It's kind of like when Jesus says it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's impossible. But then Jesus also tells his disciples when they're like, nobody can be saved. He says, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We've lost our saltiness, but God's a big God. So I think what we need to recognize as American evangelicals is that there are some things that maybe need to be fixed within our stream, within our community of believers. Maybe there's a need for revival. Maybe there's a need for reformation. 500 years ago was about the time that the Reformation kicked off. And it happened when Christians started going straight back to the source, straight back to the scriptures, and recognizing that they had this whole system of beliefs, and they already felt like they understood pretty well what God's will was. But as they opened the scriptures, they started recognizing, wait, we're off here. There are some things that we need to relearn. They weren't new things. They weren't new truths. They were very old truths, but they were truths that needed to be relearned in a new context. And so the Reformation kicked off. Within decades, it's not a coincidence that the scientific revolution kicked off because as people started studying the scriptures, they started realizing, oh, God laid down like these constant laws that govern the universe. And so even out of the Reformation kicks off like the scientific revolution the Reformation changed the world in a big way. But here's what I think. I don't think the Reformation's over. I think there's still one or two things or more that we need to better understand as a church. And so if you're somebody that likes to nerd out on Bible scholarly words, here's a couple for you. When we read the Bible for what it says, that word is exegesis. The Bible speaks to us. The Bible informs us about the truth. God gave us this for a reason. Over thousands and thousands of years, he inspired people to record his words to us. And when we read it for what it says, that's called exegesis, the Bible speaking to us. When we read into the Bible what we already know, we've already got it figured out, and so when we read the Bible, we read our understanding into it and apply it, that's called eisegesis. Don't eisegesis, exegesis, all right? Let's take a minute or two and just ask God what he's saying to us, what he's processing. Maybe he's feeding in you a hunger to study the word a little bit more than you have. Maybe he's giving you that excitement to see what we've kind of been missing, what we've been glossing over. Maybe he's got something else to say to you about, I don't know, forgiving others or something. Let's take a minute or two, okay?